so yeah, so um, um, for the past uh, couple of Beam Summits, uh, I've been uh, peddling this idea that we can visually design Apache Beam pipelines. Uh, first, this was done with a, with a Kettle plugin called Kettle Beam. I presented this in Berlin. And then in the last couple of uh, years, we've been developing an alternative platform called Hop. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Apache Hop and how we support building those uh, beam pipelines in a, a more streamlined fashion than we did the last couple of years. So uh, a lot of water has uh, uh, passed under the bridge and, and we've made tremendous progress. So welcome, Alan, if you're watching this in delayed <laughs> um, form, welcome as well. Um, so we're going to cover Apache Hop introduction and I'll explain a little bit about the tool set, uh, where to get it, uh, how to install, unzip it, <laughs> uh, some best practices to keep in mind. Um, and we'll make this presentation available in some form uh, so that you don't have to write everything down. Uh, all these things are also available uh, as best practices advice on, on the HOP website. And then obviously, uh, since this is the Beam Summit, we're going to dive a little bit deeper, uh, so last couple of years, into uh, building pipelines. We're going to cover a couple of examples, some simple ones, and then move into more advanced examples. Uh, we're going to run them on Dataflow and Spark just to see, and maybe the, the local Flink, uh, Spark, direct runners to see how that works. And, and then we can also cover some advanced topics like uh, Docker, uh, Hop Web, how to run this on, on the web, uh, logging, uh, and so on and so on. QA and wrap up, like uh, Pedro said, please ask your questions at any given time. I'm happy that we have enough time so uh, we can we can make this uh, a little bit more interactive. It is a workshop after all. So um, Apache Hop, it's like Beam stands for Beam and Stream. Hop is a very simple acronym, the Hop Orchestration Platform. Uh, recursive as per usual. So orchestration means that we're so data orchestration, right? Data pipelines and workflows. Um, it's often the case that you want to do multiple distinct things after another. Uh, we care about metadata, um, metadata management, editing them in a, in a convenient way, handling it, uh, version controlling it, etc., etc. Insight is also important. Uh, logging, execution lineage, data lineage later. All these things um, are part of the uh, of the challenge, and then configuration uh, handling, ecosystem complexity. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, um, I think uh, in general, in the data orchestration space, not enough attention is giving to a bunch of these items, and we want to address them in Apache Hub. A platform means that we have uh, a GUI, we have commands, servers, scripts, Docker containers, an API, documentation, and most importantly, a nice community. And so this community started uh, working and thinking about Hob a long time ago. And in the end, we forked the old code base, Kettle was called, uh, from uh, Pantaho, now owned by Hitachi. Uh, but there were so many things that we did to that code base to make it let's say more up to date, <laughs> to say it politely. Um, so more and more changes kept coming. And at some point we said, yeah, let's not have this 20 years of software development go to waste and let's start from scratch. So a lot of the stuff that was in Kettle actually had to go away. So the whole GUI, the, the architecture, the metadata backend, a lot of the code just, just was thrown out and rewritten. Uh, so that took a couple of years. We simplified the tool set, refactor, rename, trim down, you know, we added more and more plugins as part of Apache Hop itself, project management, unit testing, Apache Beam itself, uh, ease of debugging, years of work really. Right? And so also over a year ago, year and a half, I don't know, we, we joined the uh, 
Apache Software Foundation in the incubator program. So you can find us at hopapache.org. I don't have to put that in the chat, you will remember. And uh, so from that uh, jumping uh, platform, hopapache.org, uh, you can find getting started links at the very top right, you find links to the chats, um, the tools that we have available, GitHub, Jira, Jenkins, you know, <laughs> there's a lot, right? And so uh, we just voted on 0 0.99. Uh, it's not up on the, on the downloads yet, uh, but that will be happening uh, this weekend or on Monday. You know, it's community driven, so we take our time. Uh, we also have continuous integration builds. We're not supposed to advertise those on the download pages. Uh, but if you're interested in, in joining our community, helping us, please help us test. And, um, you know, typically if, if you go to our Mattermost server, which is a, a free uh, server, you can register for free. There's, there's absolutely no restrictions there. Uh, you can find uh, the CI builds. That would help, I mean, means a lot because uh, we really want to have our 1.0 be as stable as, as we, we can. So we're a pretty fast growing and active community. Um, so if we look at, uh, for example, the 0 0.99 release that we just did, we fixed like 317 issues. And that's for a couple of months, I think, right? And so, um, yeah, community is, is, uh, is what we're about. Uh, Apache calls itself a community building organization, and that it is. Great communities deliver great software, and that's what we that, that's what we see. You know, we get all sorts of really cool use cases and scenarios that uh, allow us to model and architect our software in a better way, straight directly from the users, from the cases, and not from some product management. <laughs> all right. And uh, so we were asked to grow the community and release software the Apache way. Um, we've been doing that for quite a while. And, you know, our mentors say that Hop is about ready to become a top level project. But we're taking our time for that. And uh, why? Because, you know, we have a quickly diversifying technological data landscape. So it seems like there's continuously... Um, new processing engines, new database technologies, one of which Neo4j, the company I work for, Graph Database. Um, so, so all these new technologies make it harder to manage uh, the complexity, all the pipelines between the, the data silos. And uh, we also see the need for rapid innovation to keep uh, up with, with all those things. Um, um, but um, yeah. Taking advantage of this moment, uh, we have a question from Marcio. If you could explain sure. how how Hop, how Hop compares to Pentaho data integration. Uh, yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, we get it a lot, right? <laughs> um, so uh, there's actually like a, a Kettle versus Hop page that we made. So Kettle uh, PDI versus Hop. And uh, so a comparison, right? So we, we renamed the, the terminology to match the terminology from Apache Beam and Apache Airflow. So instead of transformations and steps, we have pipelines and transforms. Instead of jobs and job entries, we have workflows and actions. In general, they mean the same thing, even though we do have new engines, uh, pipeline engines at the background. And like I just talked to Pedro about, we are in the process of, of uh, working and architecting uh, a new workflow uh, engine plugin for Airflow. Uh, we changed the Metastore, the metadata backend. Like I said earlier, we re rewrote the GUI, which was Spoon, it's like a hop GUI. And uh, we streamlined the tool sets. So if you wanna run something, it's called hop run. If you wanna, it's like, like uh, Flink run or Spark submit, you know what it does, right? It submits a job, it runs a job. 
the same thing. So we have a, a command line script for configuring hop, that sort of stuff. We, we I like to say we, we made it more enterprise ready. Um, no more XML or properties files, all JSON uh, to make it easier. We support unit testing, uh, Spark Fling, Dataflow through Hub. And yeah, all these things that I just mentioned, product lifecycle life cycle configuration, search through, through a whole project, configuration management, standardized metadata, and so on and so on. Um, a lot of these things I will talk about, but in general, you, you can find um, uh, more information. Uh, for those people that already have um, uh, kettle transformations and jobs and projects out there. We have an importer as well that you can use. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, opening, opening up uh, things to the community. Uh, um, I don't want to say anything bad about, about Pentao or whatever, but uh, we felt as a community that we wanted to, to move in a slightly different direction than uh, what was happening. <laughs> that slightly different direction turned out to be a massively different direction, but hey, <laughs> such is life, right? Um, so a, a couple of guiding principles that we have as well. So uh, we want to make data orchestration better by making it easy, right? easy to set things up like I, I will show you later it's it's like five minutes <laughs> um, easy to build maven uh, clean install easy to maintain whatever you uh, you set up easy to build your pipelines with a GUI easy to maintain the pipelines with a GUI with all sorts of tools with version control uh, fast, you know, startup time. If you want to compare to Kettle, that was sometimes a minute before something started up. We, we dragged that down to a few seconds. And also performance, you know, supporting the, the large scalable data engine, Sparkling, Dataflow, um, uh, through Apache Beam. And transparency uh, is really important before, during, after execution, logging, uh, logging tech, structural, um, uh, transparency when something is running, what is happening. Predictability, unit testing and integration testing is something that is uh, very important to our users, but also to the project itself. So a lot of what we're doing, uh, we're unit testing, but that has limited value. So we are also doing integration testing on Jenkins. Maybe just show you that for a second, just to give you a first. Uh, here it is. So for example, you know, um, for example, you know, we have a failing test and it's actually interesting. So Cassandra went to uh, version four the other week. And so this is running on Docker containers. And for some reason that doesn't work anymore. So probably need to upgrade our Cassandra client and so this fails automatically when we see something, we don't have to do this manually. Same for MongoDB, we're running all sorts of uh, stuff uh, against a small Mongo container, but that catches a lot, right? It's no longer just a single uh, unit test. It's like uh, testing whole pipelines and workflows that do all sorts of stuff and then compare it to golden data to, to verify that everything works correctly. Um, and that in turn helps the um, predictability, the stability of the platform in a tremendous way, right? So we want to guarantee that if we put out a 1.0 and people get, uh, upgrade to a 1.1, that not all of a sudden behavior starts to shift and, and move around. And so innovative, so need for the latest tech, the digital, digital transformation that we see and, uh, you know, what, what is important there is the ability to quickly build new plugins. So the whole of Apache Hop is built on a plugin system. And so those plugins make it easy. The plugin system makes it easy to, to, to plug in new technology. And then last but not least, supporting best practices, version control, testing, 
CIC, uh, CD, continuous integration, continuous uh, development, uh, project management, lifecycle management, those are not idle words. Uh, so we'll show you how that is done uh, in HOP. So um, architectural features, obviously an Apache public license, we're part of the Apache. Uh, we are a metadata driven platform. So there is in principle, no code generation and uh, a very modular pluggable architecture. So you can scale this back down to very small footprints. So the core of uh, Apache Hop is, is only a couple of megabytes. Uh, someone in the community created like a whole runnable uh, thing for less than 30 megabytes with a Postgres driver. <laughs> and this is, uh, um, this sounds trivial, but for microservices or also smaller devices like Raspberry Pi. So if you want to run things uh, on edge computing, uh, you know, uh, small Raspberry Pi somewhere, measuring a temperature in a factory or whatever and sending it in a streaming way continuously, you might use Hopper to run that on, the, on, that, on that small machine, right? And uh, yeah, so we, we've, uh, we've bet big on Apache Beam uh to make uh to make you successful on spark flink and, and data flow and, and uh, we have uh version control documentation so the documentation is part of the github source code it's right alongside so it makes it easy for our developers to update everything in one go we don't forget any uh anything and uh yeah, like I said, transparent naming and ease of use. Um, GUI features. So the GUI is is uh, is often underestimated how important that is. So we have a pluggable GUI. Um, so it's now very easy to just annotate the methods in a class that is annotated as a GUI plugin, and all of a sudden you have a new button in a toolbar or a new menu item. So that makes it very easy for us developers to, to make the GUI richer uh, without too much fuss, right? Add a new keyboard shortcut is just an annotation. And um, so we made, we made uh, great efforts to make this a scalable interface. It runs off of SVG files from the ground up. And the reason for that is obviously because we not only have uh, very high DPI displays, so lots of dots per inch, 4K, 8K displays uh, with weird formats, but it's also uh, important to keep our visually impaired people in mind so that if they want to run with a very large font, if they you know, want to have very large fonts, that the rest of the display just follows along. Uh, we made uh, perspectives very easily accessible so that we can switch very quickly between uh, the very, uh, you know, the pluggable uh, perspectives as well. So we have perspectives like uh, the visual drag and drop interface, the, uh, the visual representations of pipelines and graphs, but also for metadata, search, uh, the file manager, Git, uh, and so on, right? And, um, for the uh, web browser, people are running this in the web browser because we support four platforms, Windows, uh, Apple, Linux, and the web. So, um, so Hop Web, I'll show you how that works later. But so we introduced single click mode for faster navigation. And in the beginning that was like, uh, took some getting used to, <laughs> For a lot of people coming from uh, from Kettle, for example, where everything was double click, double click, but once you get used to it, it's actually such a time saver. And, uh, and yeah, so all GUI configuration options have command line variants because uh, yeah, life is not GUI. We are all often stuck on a server somewhere, <laughs> uh, so even search, even you know, the most obscure command, uh, GUI options are, are can be mapped through, through a command line uh, interface. Uh, we have a single central system for configuring things, one JSON file, not like a hundred. And um, 
like I said earlier, project lifecycle management configuration, uh, metadata inheritance from other projects, standard Docker container, stateless server supporting multi-tenancy so that you can uh, you don't have to configure anything. You just instantiate a Docker server, a server in Docker, and then you can just fire work at it from remote. Um, so let's let let's just uh, dive right in, right? Um, so whether you go to the download or not, uh, let me just uh, talk a little bit about the Java version. Uh, so for this demo, I'm going to be using uh, Java 1.8 because we are still shipping with a Spark 248 support uh, because uh, what, from what I've read, uh, Spark 3 supporting Beam is not 100% yet. <laughs> but we're ready to upgrade to 3.0, I swear. <laughs> Uh, make sure to to use the latest version of, of Java 8. I hear that there's some people uh, with older versions on Macintosh, for example, on OS X, just to make an effort so that we, because there's still updates for that. And um, you need recent versions of the Java virtual machine, Java runtime environment to automatically pick up dark mode if you're running your system in dark mode with, with let's say black uh, background windows or toolbars. Uh, those are picked up on OS X in a better way if you just update your, your Java. But you can run um, a hop on 11 or later as well. That's, that's just fine. In this case, I, I downloaded it. So, uh, so this gives me a, uh, a folder called hop and uh, um, so you can see the scripts here, like uh, hop GUI to start uh, the hop GUI. <laughs> and the bad files are uh, pretty much the same, but for Windows. So hop GUI, the, the shell scripts are for Linux OS X and um, the bad file for Windows. So uh, hopconf uh, allows you to configure stuff. Uh, hop import is for importing uh, kettle uh, transformations and jobs and hop run allows you to run stuff and in general these things are quite simple right so don't expect any we, we try to simplify it a lot so you can say okay I'm gonna run with a certain lifecycle environment or with a certain uh, project but other than that it's just specifying a file with a certain run configuration and, and off you go so let's take a look at how the GUI looks like, right? So, uh, so one of the things you'll notice is that we start up without any error logging or warnings. <laughs> if, if there is any warning during startup, that means that there's a bug and we fix it. Uh, otherwise, if there's anything really important to, to, to mention to, to the user or to us, the developers, we won't see. Uh, so by default, uh, we ship with two projects, a default project and a samples project, right? So the samples project, for example, you can open and you can see, for example, um, yeah, how to add a cyclic uh, sequence, right? Uh, thank you. And so, so this is a pipeline, right? And a pipeline for those people that don't know, um, streams data from uh, one transform to the other. And in this case, uh, let's just run this with a small local uh, runner. And so you can see like, okay, so we have a sequence, which is cyclic going from uh, one to 10 and then back around. Okay, so this first uh, perspective that we call it is a data orchestration perspective. And so the next perspective that we can look at is the metadata perspective. And what we would do here is say, okay, so we have unit tests, uh, connections, uh, data sets, uh, graph models. Uh, so 
if you have like a, a relational database connection, for example, you, you can just edit this and say, okay, this is a, a database connection for the samples on H2 hypersonic. And it's, uh, it's like a manual connection. Um, so this makes it easy to manage all the metadata that you have. Uh, we also have a file browser, which basically always starts at the root of your samples project. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how a project is defined. And you can basically see the same structure, all the uh, samples, the metadata where it is stored, and that um, relational database connection hop samples looks like this in JSON. And what we typically do is we check in these metadata things into, um, into Git, right? So if this project is uh, serialized to Git, all the Git uh, functionality lights up, like uh, information, the, the revisions, the, um, uh, the, way, the way to add, roll back, commit, or push and pull. And, uh, Search finally, so if you have, um, I don't know, all the project samples and you look for something like host name, it will find all the occurrences of the string host name in all the files in your project. That's why it took a, a, a second to, to go through everything. Uh, we also have a plugin for us uh, to see all the various plugins that are loaded for example, all the transform plugins for, you know, that's uh, how many are there? 188 transform plugins for a variety of things. Uh, the way that you uh, create new pipelines is simply create, and then you basically get an action dialogue. And these uh, action dialogues were invented to replace right-click menus, which completely got out of hand and became completely <laughs> uh, unusable, especially for people working on uh, mobile devices or on the web, you know? And so in this case, we can say, okay, let's create a new pipeline. And like the text says, tap or click anywhere to start. And now you can start adding, let's, okay, like, let's read a file, let's, um, Let's, let's read a database table or, or from Cassandra or, you know, we start puzzling together these, uh, these, these pipelines. You can also click on the name of a transform uh, and that edits the transform. So it's always like one click, very easy. You just click on the name. If you click on the icon itself, it opens up all the various uh, possibilities. You can, Say, okay, I'm going to run uh, this thing in two copies instead of one. So mean, meaning two threads at the same time. And all of a sudden we get two threads for this uh, particular engine. Um, for our um, example, uh, we are going to um, add another project. I prepared something, believe it or not. <laughs> And uh, it's actually checked into Git and it's open. And uh, so the uh, workshop Beam uh, Summit 2021 project. And um, what we can see here is that we can inherit projects from another so that if you have duplicate metadata, if you have uh, database connections or uh, pipeline run configurations or, or whatnot, uh, file definitions that are uh, the same for multiple projects that you're working on, you can just inherit that. All right, so that it already exists. So now we're gonna also add a certain lifecycle environment for this uh, uh, workshop project. The purpose is uh, development and um, I prepared one workshop uh, dev conf and this uh, file was excluded from my Git project. So I put in Git ignore so that I don't accidentally um, uh, add it. And what is in here is a bunch of uh, variables which are specific to my environment. 
So my data flow project is called Apache Hop. I run on the US East Coast where we will be doing the demo later on. This is the, mall, the, the machine type I'm, I want to use, small instances that cost next to nothing. And I created a fat jar of, of the whole, I will talk a little bit. But this is for my specific uh, environment. My Postgres server locally is, is here. If you uh, want to use these, um, uh, this example, you can just set these variables to whatever value that you have and then, it, then everything will work, right? It's that easy. All right. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So in this project, um, yeah, we will find some, some simple examples. Uh, yeah, Mikhail, Mikhail. Was there, was there a question? Actually, yeah, there's some question. I didn't want to interrupt you yet, oh, but yeah, since yeah. you already made the stop. Uh, we have some questions by Marcio about the roadmap. When, I suppose it's the most common question, when do you expect to have a production ready version? Uh, yeah, so, what... so we just released 0 0.99. Well, actually it will show up uh, tomorrow or we'll see. And uh, so uh, I would give it three, four weeks for everybody to be able to test this version. Uh, lots of people are already doing that. So 1.0 will be something, let's say five, six weeks, because yeah, let's let's take some time to, to, uh, to vote on this. So we're still in incubation. So the voting usually takes a couple of weeks. A lot of people will, will test uh, the build procedure, see that all the licenses are in order and stuff like that. So yeah, that's pretty much a 1.0. We're very close to that. Uh, personally, I, I, I could do any project with, with what we have right now. Uh, if there are any issues with the software, it's gonna be something uh, cosmetic probably, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And then there's, well, there was one question about the roadmap, but I just answered it with the link to the roadmap on the Hub website. So I guess that's the best reference. Yeah. Uh, and there's one more question by Marcio. Um, he says, one of the things that I don't like in Pentaho is that Kettle files are XML files. And every time you save them, it can change the order of the elements, which then makes it difficult to find differences, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, is this a problem with Hub files too? Do you use XML or do you use something else that makes it easier to, comp the, to find differences? The, the files are still XML. So that's one part of the... Uh of the story. The second part is that we are working uh, towards a, we're moving towards a, a more uh, generic serialization uh, method so that we can save it in, in JSON or, or other formats like YAML. However, if we take a look at something like uh, uh, this transform, for example, and we, we would change it. Um, so, uh, we, we can say like, okay, so maybe um, we can do a visual diff, right? So, so we can see like uh, moving from here to there. And so the visual diff is a great way of seeing like, okay, what has changed by using version control? Um, I think it's a better way because whether or not it's JSON or uh, some other format or XML, what we're also doing in the XML is we, we do pretty print and uh, sorting so that you have a stable output of the XML. So that might help as well. Right. Hope that answers. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but this is pretty cool, right? This, this was one of the projects uh, from Hiromu Hota, um, who also was behind uh, Hop Web. And it's a great idea. Uh, it indicates changed uh, transforms, deleted transforms, added transforms, uh, hops as well. So if, if there's a change in, in, the, in the connections between the, uh, between the transforms or workflows for that matter. 
Uh, and so by, by making this integrated into the GUI, we think that um, it's easier, right? So this is the first step. If you have more ideas for, uh, for moving this up into the GUI, whatever, uh, this is always very welcome. Uh, yeah, let's go back. Let's go back. Undo. <laughs> um, so like I said, uh, hop search is important. Why? Because there's always, I don't know, um, you might, um, you might have like hard coded an IP address somewhere, but you forgot, right? So where I have hundreds of files and, and metadata, you don't want to resort to grabbing or, or just doing complicated for loops. <laughs> We've all been there. Uh, so, um, so in this case it says, yeah, okay, so a variable was defined here that contains this, the data flow project. And so then you can just open that up and it, it jumps straight to, uh, to this, uh, yeah, to, to where it is and you just change that. So that sort of stuff is, is important. And it's important to know that we also have this uh, on the command line uh, because especially on, in those scenarios when you're working through three SSH tunnels on the other side of the world, you don't want to use the GUI because you can't. And then you just want to do the same search and get the same and say like, hey, it's stored in this JSON file, right? Just change it over there. There's where the hard coded, uh, uh, where that is, is found. Let's take a look. Um, yeah. So let's, I think uh, hop server is, is still pretty much the same as uh, it was in Kettle, even though, uh, it's made, it's been made, um, let's, like I said, almost configurationless. Uh, there's no more need to copy metadata to a remote server or something like that. Uh, AD cluster cluster systems. Uh, so pretty much uh, what we had, but made configurationless. Uh, so everything that you have metadata wise on your client will be shipped to the server. Uh, it will be completely isolated. There's nothing that one pipeline or workflow is doing on the server that will influence another one. It's completely made uh, multi-tenant. Uh, Hopconf. So we just added like a, a project for a certain folder, right? So the way that looks is, um, so we added a project called Workshop Beam Summit 2021, uh, so that yeah, I can just stop that server. So if we were on HopConf uh, project list, I'm not gonna show you the whole list of options, but uh, so here are all the, the, the projects uh, why am I getting so many is because I have set some hop variables. And the first one is I set a hop config folder uh, to where my um, uh, hop config file is, is located. And in here, it's just uh, in here, you see all your preferences for the GUI. Uh, for any plugins, like I have a Google Drive plugin, uh, talk about that later. All the projects I configured in their folders. Um, if I unset that variable, config, and this one is where all the history is, is stored because uh, Hop GUI is a stable GUI, so it remembers the open tabs, it remembers the zoom level that you had. It's it's, it tries to be as stable as possible. Uh, so hop config minus project list, and now I'm getting three projects, I guess, right? Default uh, samples and 
Uh, and that is because the default uh, configuration file is over here, uh, hop config, and the default audit folder is over here, okay? Uh, this makes it easier for us to upgrade hop without losing any of the configuration. Uh, but hop config, and this is especially useful maybe if you're doing uh, configuration, automated configuration exercises with uh, Docker or virtual machines and stuff like that. You can uh, create projects, right? Projects create and you just specify. Um, so all these GUI operations that we did have their own variants, uh, projects list, project modify. Uh, you can specify all the details of a project. Where is the metadata store? Where, what's the base path for the unit test? I'll talk about that later. Where are my uh, data sets stored for my unit test? Um, and so on and so on. Okay. Let's, uh, let's prod along. Like I said, some best practices for configuration. Um, yeah. Do the, do the sensible thing for um, for Java. But other than that, specify a hop config folder so that if you want to upgrade later on that you don't lose anything from your configuration. You, you would never lose the, the, uh, the metadata itself, but yeah, it, it, it's just a lot, lot less hassle to do it like that. Uh, the audit folder. You can specify your own hop Java home so that it makes it easier to switch between the Java versions. You can set hop options to uh, specify maximum memory use for all the tools. And we also have a hop shared GDBC folder so that you don't have to put this uh, by default, you know, you would say, so if you go to plugins, uh, databases, let's say Postgres, right? It's like a lib folder here where you can put your Postgres driver, uh, but you can also put these drivers in a dedicated folder with the latest version. And this is then specifically for the other databases that we support, like Oracle or, or proprietary driver, Snowflake, whatever, right? Uh, and that makes it easy to, again, uh, have a, a, yeah, a great upgrade path for Hop itself. And it's one place where you find the JDBC drivers and then that is, uh, that is configured. Um, so yeah, here, like I said, projects, um, they make it easy to uh, to check everything into GitHub. So my whole project, the workshop Beam Summit, let me zoom in again for people that are um, watching this later. Um, so get status up to date, right? Uh, makes it easy to just check this whole thing in. And the only thing I have in Git Ignore is this uh, workshop dev a configuration file that I showed you earlier with the variables. And that makes it very easy to just check this stuff out on another server, on another PC for, for you to create a new configuration file, type in the variables and you're done. But this means that uh, it makes it very easy to move from development to test to acceptance to production, right? Uh, a very simple way of doing that was something that uh, that is worth a lot. Okay. Um, so projects environments are like the counterpart of that. And I have to mention that you can specify as many uh, of these configuration files as you want. So if you have uh, like a configuration file for all the projects that are working on your machine, on your workstation, on your server, you can just add more uh, for those, right? And like I said, version control. Uh, this is not for the hardcore developer. 
but as we'll see later on, if you're working on a remote server using Hot Web, for example, or a Docker container or something like that, it's very useful to at least have the ability to do the, the minimal, right? Uh, push, pull, commit, rollback, uh, add uh, files. Um, so unit testing. Um, so built-in support for unit testing has been also something that has been very valuable. Um, uh, let's take a quick look at how that looks like um, in our project. Let's take, uh, <laughs> I think I have a, so this one, I will go over this later on, but uh, this sketches like a complex scenario. Uh, this is one of the earlier test cases that we had for Beam uh, for seeing how you can silo data uh, or target specific transforms in a pipeline, uh, collect data, aggregate data, uh, do a join, that sort of stuff. Now, if we want to test this locally here, uh, separate from uh, let's say S3, Google Storage, HDFS data, and we want to test with a small data set, we call it, uh, we can provide that data set as part of the unit test that we have here. In this case, we have a unit test called customer input, and we can just say, okay, so this is like a couple hundred records uh, that we put in here for testing purposes only. Uh, typically what you would do is maybe uh, copy paste this in from Excel, or there are ways to uh, just uh, to create a data set and write by running a pipeline, but uh, maybe it would stretch. Uh, <laughs> I see that we're almost at the top of the first hour and we haven't really dived into Beam yet, uh, but it's it's quite easy to set up. So if you, if you look in the metadata and you see all the data sets for uh, uh, I call the data sets in this case uh, by the name of the file and then golden at the end. And the, the input is more generic. So customer's input and state data input is just states with the population. And uh, they are backed by a CSV file so that you can check in these CSV files as well. The CSV files are stored per the project definition in the data sets folder. You can also set something up uh, shared by multiple projects. Um, so here's a golden data set, so a simple CSV file. Um, all right. So if we can set uh, input data sets uh, for these two, and we can set up the expected output, then we have a unit test, right? So if we run this with a local runner, uh, so this is the, uh, let's call it simplistic, optimistic engine. It doesn't have uh, things like uh, fail, retry, like Spark, Flink, or Dataflow. We don't need those because we support them in other ways. But what it's really good at is just squeezing the data through the pipeline in a parallel, very fast fashion. Um, optimistically, right? And uh, there's a lot of ways for us to capture the data back and say, okay, so this is the output and I, uh, I test this and this worked correctly. Now, if, if there's for any reason, um, let's take uh, New York rocks and you say, I'm gonna add a couple of exclamation marks. I'm gonna break the unit test and run it, it will pop up saying like, hey, something went wrong, right? It detects it and it will say which uh, which records. So it's pretty similar, like you would run maybe a unit test in, in, a, uh, in an IDE. And we wanna get as close to that as, as possible. And obviously, um, yeah roll back. <laughs> um, so that those are unit tests and you can create unit tests. Uh, you can create more than one unit test. Uh, yeah, and, and the unit test can be set to uh, be selected automatically. There's a relative path. 
you can you can do just I'm developing stuff. So that's another use case. So if so suppose that you're just developing. Um, so I guess in, in this scenario, uh, we just clear the golden data. So because sometimes it's just hard to get to data, right? Maybe this input is a long running Hive query uh, against the Hadoop cluster. Maybe it's it's a big query query and you don't wanna continuously pay for all these queries. You don't wanna wait for the results to see. Maybe you just wanna take a few hundred records and, and, and start from that or a million for, for all I care, right? Uh, so that makes uh, development easier. Sometimes as a, as a data orchestration developer, you don't have access to the data. Uh, you can use this for test-driven development. Suppose somebody says, here's the input, here's the output, figure out a way to do it. Then you can do test-driven development. Okay. All right. Enough about unit testing. Um, but if you have unit testing, uh, you can also do integration tests. And the integration tests um i already showed those uh let me just uh open up my other environment where i have projects for all the integration tests and uh, let me show you an example of how you can do this uh there there's no good or bad way to do this but uh for our neo4j project for example uh we say okay so let we have a Docker container running automatically. This is orchestrated by Docker Compose in this case on, um, on Jenkins, on the Apache uh, Jenkins servers. So we clean it up because there might have been junk from other integration tests. Then we create some nodes. And in the end, uh, we validate whether or not a certain query that we do against the database uh, matches um, yeah, matches uh, uh, this customer's data set, right? Uh, and it's a very simple way of doing things, um, but it catches so many issues you wouldn't believe. It. <laughs> uh, it's so valuable because you can build whole workflows and pipelines, multiples, and it tests a lot of uh, moving parts in the code base at the same time. And if even the slightest byte is different at the end from what you expect, uh, then you have an issue to, to solve, right? So very useful. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we have uh, containers for Postgres, Neo4j, Mongo, Cassandra, there's a whole bunch of them. And we continuously um, write more and more integration tests. So we're at the top of the first hour, ready to start with Beam. Are there any other questions, Pedro? Yes, we actually have a question from Landy Reyes. Uh, okay. She's asking, she's mentioning, in some telco or digital media projects, we need to interact with Impala, Hive, or Spark in a secured cluster, like with Kerberos, GitHubs, or certificates that are involved. Um, mm -hmm. How can we do this with Hub? So yeah, so uh, Kerberos, um... I guess, you know, the easiest way to, to do it now would be to run K in it. Um, um, but specifically for Lambda, you just uh, work with us in the community and, and we'll, we'll help you solve your, your specific problem. It's hard to give a specific uh, answer to this. Uh, we don't have, um, let's say, uh, Automated Kerberos support, yeah, but we do plan to, to add those things. Um, right now, we've we've focused more on Apache Beam and less on Apache Hadoop. It's fair to say that, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that if there are requirements that we that we can't look at this in an easy way, uh, be because we, we, we did make it a lot easier to, to plug these uh, features in. All right, any other question? Um, no, that's it. All right. Um, so like I just said, the, the samples I'm, I'm showing you are found at, uh, um, at workshop uh, Beam Summer 21. And, um, 
So the first thing that we can uh, talk about is a new guide that uh, I wrote a couple of weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, uh, about links to, okay, what is Apache Beam? How does it work? Um, if you're familiar with, with Kettle or Hop, you will find that everything I just said about Apache Hop and pipelines applies to, to Beam, right? Uh, Beam consists of pipeline, which consists of transforms, which perform functions and transfer the data um, through P collections, but basically they represent the, uh, the transform output. Uh, so the terminology is 100% uh, translatable. What we did to support Beam in a, in a flexible way is, is build uh, what we call runtime engines. And uh, so let's take a look at the metadata. Um, so the simplest one is the direct engine. Uh, so you can see the different uh, uh, pipeline run configurations in the metadata. Um, this is annoying. <laughs> but you will also see it if you're executing this. So, so, so the pipeline run configuration at the very top, uh, you can select from all the defined ones, but you can also uh, create or edit uh, the pipeline configuration here. Suppose you wanna see the first records in these mini data grids or the last ones. I usually find the last ones more relevant if you're developing these things. Uh, the local engine is, is, is quite useful for like what I said, I'm developing this locally. I'm making sure my unit test runs correctly. And then if I'm done with that, maybe I can try to run it with the Beam Direct Runner. Let's, uh, let's edit this one. You can specify the number of workers and so on and so on. And basically you, you run this right. And now it starts up a, uh, it starts building a beam pipeline in the background. And the cool part is that the exact same code that we run for all the engines, always the same because it's, it's the hop code, which is, uh, which is reused. In every transform, there's like a little bit of, um, uh, how should I say this? Uh, there's a little wrapper that says, okay, I'm going to not run this in a classical pipeline, a local pipeline, uh, but I'm going to uh, run this in a uh, function or transform. I'm gonna handle this metadata and, and run it through. Okay. Um, it's cool to see that we can also do this, and maybe this is a great example uh, generate some data, right? So let's take a file, this one, uh, maybe go to my project output. Yeah, that's, that's great. Okay. So let's, let's take hop run and the pro the environment was called, uh, work uh, workshop Beam Summit 21. That was the environment. Um, and then the file is this one and the run configuration. Uh, I don't know what we have. Uh, damn it. <laughs> uh, let's, let's look at it again. Maybe it's the wrong one. I think it was uh, Flink Local or something. Yeah, Flink Local. So this will start a uh, Flink. So, but basically all these uh, run configurations are supported simply by, by name, right? <coughs> Sorry. And um, 
So this also means that if you have a, uh, a workflow, um, you can simply specify, so yeah, this is done. Uh, so this is the, the output of generate some data. Um, let's take a look at generate some data. I see that I have a, my other configuration file. I was in the wrong <laughs> uh, GUI. As you can also see, it's easier to just um, kill and restart these tools if it only takes a few seconds, right? <laughs> um, so, so what this, for example, does, it says I'm going to generate ten, a thousand empty rows, generate a UID, uh, there's other random values that you can generate, but a UUID, uh, fake data generates Game of Thrones characters. So Game of Thrones, the characters. And then I'm using some JavaScript to say, while visiting the city of whatever Game of Thrones city you have, uh, of house, whatever house, and you know, some, something stupid, right? Uh, but these are basically the lines that are ending up here. Uh, the cool thing is that you can also see this here in the output. Uh, um, yeah, so pretty straightforward, a simple uh, pipeline to get started. Uh, this was executed with the Flink um, pipeline engine. Usually if you mouse over the, the label, you can see a tooltip and uh, Flink and Spark have this embedded engine, uh, local engine, we call it. In this case, for Flink, you configure it by local between square brackets. Uh, for Spark, it's local for, so it's a different form of, of specifying it. Um, and finally, data flow. Like I said, this was configured specifically for me. Um, so if we would run the same uh, pipeline on Dataflow, so um, again, it would, uh, it would build this pipeline and send it off. Now, Dataflow, the first time that you do this, um, it will load your fat jar uh, <laughs> into the cloud, into uh, wherever you specified uh, the... Um, the staging location, the binaries. And it will actually check some of this and see if that file has changed. How do you generate a fat jar that contains uh, all the software in your uh, uh, in your hub installation with all the plugins that you install? Well, you can do this using tools, generate a hub fat jar, or you can do this, and this time I am going to set Config. Forward. So you can also do this with uh, hop config minus fat jar, and then uh, you know choose my fat 1.0 jar uh, for hop, and it will basically collects all the uh, jar files. Uh, Add a jar. And uh, so, yeah, that's as easy as that is. Um, we've kept a close watch on all the dependencies that there are no collisions. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of stuff that we had to do to do that. Uh, so if you specify that one um, and you run this one, you can go to your data flow jobs in that, in that sense. Uh, refresh it. And what we'll see is that um, this thing is, is spinning up. I specified two workers, US East. And um, yeah, it's going to get some counters. Now, what I did was like uh, locally here, let me just go to the direct runner. I can specify variables on the level of this run configuration as well. 
So for the direct runner, I have an input file with 1000 rows. So this one, right? Very simple, small text file uh, because the direct runner is, is for small things. <laughs> it loads too much in memory. Uh, for the data flow runner, we can say, well, actually for, for this customer's file, use 1 million records. Uh, so what happens is that now we can, we can say, um, yeah, we're gonna see a million, oh, this is still a thousand. Uh, I don't know why that's, all. oh, that just generates a million, uh, a thousand files. If I am uh, processing a file, like in the next example, like uh, read a file, right? So this example reads this uh, input file, like it's very simple. Uh, with a certain file definition that we can define so that we don't have to redefine at all it's, it's reusable file definitions. It aggregates the counts per state and then compares that to, to population data and uh, it writes that back out. So this is an example of a stream lookup. What it does is site loading this population data and there's a look, it's a hash map in memory basically, right? And so this one, well, if this one is done, it's still uh, cleaning up, I guess, shutting down again. I have a limited amount of things I can run at the same time on data flow. Um, so let me steam ahead a little bit until that one is done. Um, so generate some data. This, this is uh, used synthetic uh, YO. This is, a, this is uh, a, uh, a YO that generates synthetic data. And there is another variant uh, that says, I'm going to continuously, it's an unbounded uh, YO, it's going to continuously generate uh, data. In this case, let's use the Spark local variant. Uh -huh. uh, so so what we're happening, what's happening now is that we, we generate like 100 records per second. Uh, by setting a 10 milli millisecond uh, on average, it's not it's not exact, right? It's not an exact sign. It will do the same exercises before, and then it will bound everything up in 60 second windows. This is this is a windowing example, and then do a window right to to our output folder, right? And I guess then we look in the output folder and see whatever pops up here. We don't need this one anymore. And the output location is, is again uh, defined by data output. And in the Spark, uh, we can specify that the output is in our project home output folder. So now every minute we see four new files pop up. So that's kind of like the idea. At the at the end of every minute, the end of every minute window, uh, we get uh, we get some files, right? And uh, so this is what we call an unbounded pipeline. So like Beam is stream and batch. This one is batch. It's just a finite amount of records. And this one is an unbounded uh, pipeline, All right? Uh, other things you can do with uh, unbounded pipelines, oh, let's just go for beam, is, uh, is get or put a timestamp on this. And you can actually change a bounded pipeline, so a batch pipeline into an unbounded one by simply setting a timestamp on it. So, uh, so that is possible. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Generating some data. Um, uh, 
let's take a look at the next example we can so now things are getting interesting so if we if you get back to the getting started guide so how are my pipelines executed there's some information that you can uh you can go over and see that okay so we have beam specific transforms which are only going to run on uh, beam pipelines there's not that many right so uh, in the big data category you have specific support for BigQuery uh, which we will transform most of these will at some point be transformed into uh, generic transforms which will work on, on any pipeline but for now um, BigQuery, Bigtable, uh, Google pops up specifically for uh, data flow and GCP usage I guess uh, Beam input, which reads from files, CSV files. Uh, Kafka consume and Kafka produce, which I'll show in a, in a bit. Uh, beam output, timestamp, and beam window. Other than these, um, there are some universal transforms, which work in, in any scenario. Memory group by, merge join, generate rows. That's one of the... Um, one of the useful ones that we've uh, that we've converted to work in in any scenario. Why? Because it's easy to to um, to do testing with with the, with generate rows. Right? There's a couple that are unsupported: unique, group by, and sort. Uh, group by was a very is very specific uh, legacy. It supports things like. Um, uh, uh, return all rows and uh, options that are not available, right? And sort rows, I think it's not supported by Beam. I could have changed. And then all the other 170 whatever uh, transforms are simply available for your use use cases. So anything that you uh, use, uh, all the others are just working uh, as as is on. Uh, on any engine. There are a few things that we need to keep in mind though. So for non-beam input transforms, so this is uh, adequately explained in here. So automatically we will force a single thread for this uh, transform. Suppose that you use something like a table input, an Excel input file, a uh, the reading of a uh, uh, a non-parallelizable, that's a JSON document, an XML file, right? One thing. Uh, for those, we basically force a, a group by and a flatten and iterate over a single value to force a single instance, right? For the output side, uh, you can have something similar. Uh, so suppose that you just want to have as an output of a parallel exercise, a single XML file. Well, you can just say single beam as the copy here, specify copies in your space. I, I want to have a single beam. This is to indicate to the uh, pipeline generator that we need to do a similar exercise on the output side. Namely, uh, do a group by over the whole data set over uh, without a key which uh, allows us to iterate in a single thread over all the input values and then force everything into a single uh, thread. It's basically collecting all the data uh, from all the various parallel jobs into a single uh, point, right? And then finally, if you have uh, transforms like table output, which use a JDBC driver, or Neo4j, uh, or MongoDB, or uh, there's a lot of cluster databases in the mix, right? And cluster databases uh, have topologies which make it easier for them to collect data in batches, uh, batches of, say, a couple of thousand records at a time, uh, because they find it uh, more efficient to process the data that way. And uh, the, the, the model, internal model of, um, of, let's say, a transform is that it accepts a row and pushes it back out one at a time. And so what we did from the, the hop side is uh, for those cases where you do want to use these uh, traditional outputs, and there's 
quite a few out there for all sorts of weird file formats is that you can specify um, for those transform a flush interval. So you, you can say like, I wanna batch up the data in that transform and only that one is influenced though. You said batch has the number of copies, but I wanna only keep it like for a second at the most and then flush it to disk, right? Flush it to, to, your, uh, to, to the Postgres in this example. Uh, and I wanna keep a thousand records uh, at once at the same time. So for this case, it, it really helps performance a lot. Uh, it will still do things in parallel. And so if you don't want to do that in parallel, uh, you can basically specify copies, batch, uh, beam, single, all right? This is to, uh, to kind of, uh, solve the issue of massive parallelism, the inherent parallel tendencies of, let's say, a data flow engine. Uh, all right. And uh, so this is explained over here. Uh, if you do that, let, let's just uh, take a look at the job, uh, the, the workflow that I have here. Uh, so this workflow basically says, I wanna truncate this uh, customer's table in my Postgres database. And Postgres is simply on my local host, but again, it's configured uh, through this environment config file. And then I wanna run this with the Flink local executor. And um, so let's, let's see how that works. So Flink uh, is doing its thing. And then we can take a look at the Postgres database, maybe, yep. and see the number of rows growing. So this is pretty much how it is done. So what we, what, what I see in, in these exercises is that uh, in this scenario, I can see the, the thing running and I can see some indirect evidence of that, uh, but the only really uh, great runner in that respect is Dataflow, which really gives me uh, feedback on, okay, so how many records did I, did I produce, right? How many, um, the other runners will only give that feedback at the end of, uh, at the end of the pipeline. So, so those, those are kind of like the differences. That is uh, more uh, a question of the, the runners and what they support in terms of uh, metrics, giving them back asynchronously or synchronously. Uh, so in this case, this thing is running and when it's finished, I'm getting the, the results, right? We added some metrics to increase the transparency a little bit. The number of inits is basically the number of times that we initialized uh, the uh, hop code on the various uh, parts of whatever topology is being used by the engines, right? Could be different nodes, different servers, or just simple threads. Um, for uh, load in database, let me just truncate this quickly. Uh, for uh, for this one, uh, so there's a cool shortcut. If you uh, so you can see basically at the bottom. So you can open this uh, this pipeline here with either hitting Z over this icon or Shift Control click. So Z opens this up, and let's just run this with Flink local. I show you the uh, the other metric is the is the number of times uh, data was flushed from that mini buffer that we created inside that transform function um, to 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 batch up the data a little bit more for for the underlying transforms and so we get those numbers of number of flushes not just the initializations and the flushes Incidentally, the, num the data reported back for local engines or for beam engines 
and for the various scenarios differs a little bit. Um, so here you can see the number of flushes, right? Uh, 200 flushes times 5,000 is, is probably some, somewhere around a million. Um, so what else did I want to do? Uh, read file. So this exercise, I think my data flow, yeah, this is done. Uh, I really need to figure out how to get more bandwidth <laughs> on data flow. Um, so instead of uh, so data, instead of a, uh, a thousand records, we're now going to read uh, a million, right? And again, uh, we can see this thing uh, pop up. If the first time that you do this exercise and you you don't see anything happening, uh, run a tool like uh, BMon. So uh, so BlockMon allows you to say I'm going to uh, monitor my network interface to see whether or not it's, it's uploading a lot of uh, data, uh, not in bytes per second, but in, in kilobytes or megabytes. <laughs> it's gonna upload 400 uh, megabytes, but it's only gonna do this the first time, as you can see in, in, the, other, in, in the other scenarios, if, if your fat jar is already uh, up there, so this one, then it's gonna take a few seconds and then it's, it's up and running. All right, so yeah, then we'll get feedback again. And uh, I guess uh, that's an important block. Most of the issues we've had with data flow is basically setting up a security or uh, uh, the service account. Uh, should I get into that? Uh, so there's more information on the various runners um, that you can find here. Uh, the easiest way to get this uh, started is basically is setting Google application credentials to your uh, Google key. And uh, that should get you up and running on the data flow side of things uh, that can be found here in the service accounts, right? So in this particular case, I set up a service account for testing and I gave it pretty much all the, uh, <laughs> all the uh, permissions in the book. There's a new role that I created called uh, Apache Hop Testing. Uh, because I was testing with BigQuery, BigTable, a lot of stuff. I just gave it a lot of, uh, it needs computing access. It needs storage access. So I just, yeah, just to save me some time. I'm sure there's some best practices documents from, from Google <laughs> somewhere that that, uh, that documents this, this better than, uh, than I'm doing here. But that's where it comes down to. Um, uh, so yeah, so so a million records got processed. Once it's up and running, it's actually pretty quick. Even though this exercise costs probably like less than ten cents or something in computing time, um, these are great examples, right? Uh, okay, let's uh, see what we've covered here. Beam specifics. Yeah, things to watch out for. Um, very once in a while. Um, and most of the time we, we can see the logging of whatever we're doing very once in a while there are some uh, exceptions that are being logged by some process uh, we, we catch all the logging from uh, uh, the, the popular Java logging but once in a while there are some exceptions or some some useful messages that, that pop in here yeah, we're still chasing those uh, so if you can't immediately find out <laughs> What kind of weird exception you get? Then look in the in the console, maybe. Uh, for uh, the never-ending streaming uh, exercises like this one, uh, I can try to kill it. It's going to send the signal to Flink, 
but it's the Flink local runner and it doesn't support asynchronous uh, halting of the pipeline. So it's going to try to do this. Um, I guess now it worked, right? <laughs> but sometimes it doesn't. And I'm not always sure why that is. Maybe it's some in, some runners and some not. But um, uh, So those are the things, the minor things, I'd say. Um, patching, forcing a track. Fat jars and metadata export. Okay, so for executing something on, let's say, a Spark server, right? a Spark cluster. Uh, let's start a Spark cluster. So I have some notes for Matt. Uh, let's start a, a Spark master on, on my very laptop. It's all pretty vanilla, 2.4.7 or 2.4.8. Um, and this one, right? So local host 81.80. So we have like one worker, but it could be bigger, right? Uh, uh, this is not meant to be some kind of like spark <laughs> tutorial. And I see that we only have like a half an hour plant left, but I just wanted to, to address a little bit like, okay, so uh, this, instance of hop is running on the same instance as um, uh, as the Spark master. So what we're doing when we say, okay, I wanna run this or generate some data, right? So let's, let's take this small example and say, I wanna run on Regal, which is my laptop, um, which is basically this, right? I just copy this in here. Uh, the only thing you might have an issue with is the standard uh, Spark setup things, like make sure that this is a, a host name that is known by both your client and the server, stuff like that, right? Uh, bundle size. Uh, you can basically just run this. And uh, then uh, it starts working. So that's as simple as it is. And for Flink, the same thing. So they, it, what will happen is a Spark submit or a Flink run will be done for you automatically, right? Uh, and I don't think this this is going to take too long. And again, you know, the output will will pop in here. Uh, so generate some data. Um, there is another way to do it though. Um, and sometimes you're not running on the same um, node, right? Not on the master. You 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 SSH into it. You stored your uh, your fat jar in S3 or HDFS. Uh, my uh, my friend Hans has been running on EMR on Amazon EMR, for example. So so those have like their own specific. Uh, ways of doing it but uh so we created a, a new class called main beam for you and this is documented in the spark runner where you can do a spark submit this is all standard right we, we we have this main beam and so to map my java project java uh, my project home directory uh to wherever so that the the variables remain valid in this case uh, but, but usually on a server, it might be something else. So what, what we also do is like, we, we don't have access to the metadata in principle on a server. So you can export this metadata uh, to a single JSON file. So all the information that is in here uh, is gonna be encapsulated in one single file. So we already did this. Uh, it's just uh, not formatted, but Trust me, everything is in there. <laughs> uh, and uh, finally, so the the exercise that we have is zero three read file the pipeline. Uh, so in in our uh, server example, we would SSH to that remote server, check out the Git project maybe, or or just copy the 
the pipeline for this uh, read file. And before I do, let me just clean out everything here for us for another time. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, this Spark submit. Uh, so this main class basically accepts the fat jar. The no, this is. Uh, these are all commands that are being interpreted by, uh, by this uh, main beam. What we are doing is we're loading Hadoop uh, drivers. So you can store these in HDFS, but you do need to set up your Hadoop com folder and, and configure access to HDFS uh, so that you can run this on, on Hadoop, for example. Right? Uh, so this is, uh, it will, will say, okay, I found these arguments. Uh, uh, obviously there's some, something wrong. Usually, uh, yeah. Uh, root config, I'm not loading that one. Hmm. That's weird. We go. Anyway, I see that we were running late with this. Uh, so, but that's, that's pretty much all you need to do. I think uh, maybe my fat jars, uh, uh, let me just room mat parking. <sighs> yeah, it looks good. I don't know. I don't know what's driver. Spark Miguel. Maybe uh maybe the metadata that I need to do again. Let's let's skip this for now. Uh, I just tried it earlier. There's probably something wrong with my metadata. Um there are a few things that I still want to cover, and then we maybe can circle back to, to Spark later on. And that is um just uh, and that is obviously uh, Kafka, right? Uh, so these uh, streaming exercises made easy. Um, let's uh, let's take a look at the uh, Kafka. It's the same same line exercise here, uh, generating one row a second and producing output. Again, I'm gonna take a quick look to see whether or not this has shut down, so that is fine. So let's just start this on data flow again. Uh, so this is gonna cause a never ending uh, pipeline to be started on data flow. And that just takes a few seconds, here we go. And it's going to produce records, right? It's going to produce very simple uh, messages just containing a uh, one quote line from Game of Thrones. And for our uh, scenario, I'm, I'm sending this off to a server somewhere in Germany that I set up for the occasion. Uh, the topic is Game of Thrones. And then on the other side, um, I can just read these uh, consuming the the way of processing in the beam engines and the local engines is different uh, for local engines uh, we have a Kafka uh, consumer so this Kafka consumer which is apparently broken uh, requires us to execute a sub pipeline in batches and micro batches or whatever you call so we read a thousand records 
we force them through a sub pipeline and if that one is done then we we uh, we grab the next batch of records obviously in a, in a beam part pipeline this is done differently this is uh, these these uh, bundles are, are monitored uh, throughout the life cycle of um, of the pipeline itself so it's easier to do it over here right uh, so we can just uh, uh, run this and and save this to 08 consuming and again let's just take uh, our trusty flink uh, thing see that it's starting uh, so once this thing starts to produce uh, data uh, we'll see this pop up in the uh, output folder all right so again you know we, we can't really 100% um, translate all the concepts for, because the transactional model in this case is different uh, between the local pipeline engine, so the, the very optimistic one, and the beam engine. So depending on what you need, you can use either. Um, that's probably the, the, the only exception so these, these uh, streaming consuming uh, pipelines, which are different between let's say Kafka or uh, Kinesis or PubSub uh, for the local engine and beam. Uh -huh. Don't need this one. So let's give this one a second. And uh, yeah, again, it's using like an unbounded synthetic, uh, synthetic unbounded source. This is uh, synthetic YO. This is simple wrapper around that. And uh, yeah. So yeah, we, we started to, to write some data. And uh, like I said, it, it's cool that the transparency is available, right? Just gonna just do one record a second. If I'm if I'm producing too many records, maybe you know at some point when I'm pulling it back in, Zoom will have an issue here on this side. So I'm very careful with not producing like millions of records a second. Um, if I do this uh, without a break, it it could generate a, a really a lot of, of data. Um, so yeah, so this is just very convenient very transparent uh well done by google i would say <laughs> uh, and on the other side obviously this this fling thing is running but we don't see it uh, but we can look at the output right so we started to receive uh, some data uh, first nine records for the time period uh, yeah this minute until this minute and then for the next minute ending in 10 seconds, we'll get uh, four blocks of 15, 14 records. It, it, it fluctuates a little bit. The synthetic IO was originally created for stress testing services and stuff like that. And you can use it for that. It's, it tries to be somewhat accurate, but these, these are like, uh, yeah, averages, guesstimates. Um, Matt, um, we have yeah. a request from Brandon Jackson asking if, if you could please commit the environment.json file to the repo with a note to keep it separate from real world projects, just so that it helps people yeah. get up and going with the samples quicker, you know, because those environment level variables may impact the project. Absolutely. So what I'll do is uh, sample def. There you go. And uh, yeah, I think uh, most of these things, you know, there's actually nothing in here that that uh, that that, uh, that you can't uh, see or use <laughs> because you know the security for for data flow is all driven through the service account, so. Uh, it doesn't really uh, affect anyone. Right. 
but yeah, so so this um, this is, is something that um, uh, yeah, old habits die hard. Uh, so so this is something that um, that I had as a remark as well earlier on the on the on the chat is that we need to find a way to um, to expose the list of, of used environment variables in a project in general, uh, maybe through some tool and to generate like an, an empty environment file for all the use. So we can do that. I think it's just a, uh, uh, a button that we need to add somewhere. So great question. Thanks, uh, Brandon. Um, great remark. So that is in there. And in the meantime, yeah. Um, so that's still producing records uh, every uh, minute or so. All right, uh, I see that we have about 15 minutes left. You want me to try to get the spark thing going again or not? I'm inclined to, to see if people have more questions. Um, Think, um, um we we don't have more at this moment um, okay great bart i still have a bart few... martens has helped us reply some questions in chat cool uh thank you bart uh so i think we've we've went through these topics uh there are some advanced topics i want to maybe touch upon a little bit or as far as uh, hop is concerned. So like I said earlier, we are um, kind of like big on uh, logging, reflection, uh, because if you run something every night or during the weekend, you come back uh, in the morning, on Monday morning, uh, and something went wrong and something always goes wrong because somebody was running the backup, there was somebody working on the network or, you know, some disk ran out of space or, you know, I keep I kept saying in the, in the early days, projects don't fail when they have just been put in production. Then everybody's looking at it and it's always like six months afterwards when the data volume just get, gets a little bit too big. So logging is important. So in the past, uh, since people mentioned the, the kettle days, um, you had this notion that, well, you know, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna set up a database, a relational database to store the information. In. So what we've done with um, uh, uh, with Hop is, is go a little bit beyond that. So we can say like. Um, uh, log pipelines, right? So we want to log all the pipelines and we want to create a new pipeline in this projects. Uh, logger for pipelines. So this pipeline now is going to be executed every time uh, that some other pipeline runs. So if we run generate some data, this pipeline is going to be executed. When is it going to be executed? Well, that depends. So we can execute it at the start of the pipeline or only at the end of the pipeline or periodically every 30 seconds. And so what this allows us to do is say like, okay, so um, instead of logging to a local file, all of a sudden I can send this information off to, I don't know, a web service somewhere uh, S3, HDFS, uh, your own custom plugin to capture it. We were thinking about supporting things like Stackdriver, the Amazon version or the Azure version of that. And the same for workflows. What kind of information do we have available? So you can hit the space bar over these transforms, but show output fields. So we have the logging date, the logging phase, start, end, or periodic the name of the pipeline. So we have a lot of, the, the log channel ID is the hierarchical, um, is a hierarchical bit of information. So if you know the parents and you know when that was logged, so you can build the whole execution lineage off of that. Um, so 
So there's a lot of information, how many records got written, written, the logging text, everything is available for you. Uh, you can also choose to not have all the transform details, just stick to the uh, to the basics and then it's it's a lot less. And the same is, is true for these uh, workflows. So the, uh, you have all the hierarchical information available. So you can send it to a database, uh, you can send it to S3 uh, in an Azure blob, uh, whatever, right? Anything that is available in the hop ecosystem, you can fire this all. Okay, so uh, reflection uh, is a way to do something similar, but then for the data. Uh, so for, and to make this run, you, you, you just need to define the metadata element. And if you define multiple, then multiple pipelines will be executed for every pipeline that you run. Okay, so take that into account. So you can disable these if you're testing. And um, reflection is basically a pipeline probe where you say, I'm going to be um, reading data from source pipe. This works only for uh, the local pipeline engine for now. Uh, so this is the, the caveat. Um, I haven't, we haven't found a good way to do this for, uh, for beam pipelines, but yeah, not a lot of people are, are using this. There's a way to do web services, right? Something similar than what we have here is, you know, you have a hop server running somewhere and, uh, you want to just say, uh, get me some data. That's the name of the service. Uh, I want to have this enabled. This is the pipeline that I'm going to execute every time somebody uh, calls this certain uh, web service. Let me just jump a little bit to the web service documentation. Uh, so, so basically you have this web service URL that you can call with the name of the service, in this case, get me some data. You can pass parameters and variables and they will all be mapped, right? And then uh, what you can then do is say, I'm gonna pick up the output from a certain transform, a field, set the content type to whatever you want. You can output images, SVGs, whatever. And you can list a status on the server. Usually we don't do this because they're like small, small transactions. Um, now I'm very happy that I can run over time a little bit. <laughs> uh, Docker, right? Also important to mention. Uh, so these are these these advanced topics are mentioned because uh, we get questions about them, right? So that's why I'm I'm, I'm passing them on. Uh, so if you want to, let's say, start a um, I don't know a beam pipeline somewhere in the cloud using Kubernetes, well, you want to have a Docker uh, container maybe. And so the Docker container is a standard Docker container. Uh, I think Docker hub. Uh, so this one, so the, uh, the incubator hop one. And so the latest that, that you, you can use latest, which will, I don't know, when will that be updated? I guess one of these days, <laughs> or maybe already to 0 0.99, I don't know, a day ago. So so this is 0 0.99. So the, the Docker is already updated. And uh, here are all like the, the environment variables that you can pass to it. Uh, and it's easy to just map your project uh, to the container or use this as a base container to extend and completely roll your own, right? Uh, obviously the, the the Docker container is built automatically by the source code. So you can see the Docker files in, in the source code. Uh, you can also do a long lift container, a hop server by just specifying username, uh, password and port on which port you wanna run. And here's some examples of that, right? And uh, Last but not least, uh, some fun with Hop Web. Um, so you can run the whole Hop GUI in your browser. 
typically, you know, again, you can, you can just do this uh, and then you get 0 0.99, which is perfect or help us test with a 1.0 snapshot. Um, maybe, uh, maybe just kill my uh, streaming data generator producer. This will actually stop it on the, um, uh, on the data flow side. So let's check. Yeah, it's stopping. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, next week, I'm going to get a large bill. Um, uh, so, help web. We don't need this anymore. Uh, we don't need... Uh, there's been stop slave. I think I'm having some stop master. Uh, so let's let's say um, so first do an update right see if there's another build that we need to fill in so we're up to date and then uh, running this uh, uh, you basically map the port of the tomcat that's running inside this docker container and you can set a hop web team so maybe let's just take the dark team to see how that looks um, so where did I, there you go. So Docker run 8080 and, uh, I'm pretty sure that doesn't paste well. So let's be a bit more careful with the spark example. And so in a few seconds, so this, this starts remarkably fast, actually. Um, 80, 80. So in a, in a few seconds, um, here we are, we will, we will get basically the same user interface, uh, but in dark mode, right? Uh, so the samples project, and you can open these transforms. Uh, this is the same example as before. Usually you will find that the first couple of, uh, the first minute or so, it's a little bit sluggish. And then it's once um, a lot of code is in the cache of that Tomcat. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite usable. Um, so all the, yeah, you can, you can do anything that you do with the full client uh, with this one. I don't think there are any exceptions right now. The uh, the dark mode looks a little bit funky now that uh, you know on the, <laughs> on a non dark mode desktop, but it was just for to show off. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's documentation on how to put uh, uh, security on top of this. Uh, we haven't really moved beyond that. So I was hoping at some point to, uh, to put security metadata, have action-based security, so to have people being able to do read-only mode for certain projects. But that is stuff that surely will, will pop up in the future. I'm looking forward to your feature request on this. Uh, but because this thing starts so fast, uh, the original author, Hiromo Holta of, of uh, Hopweb thought that <laughs> it could be a good idea to just um, uh, start a, a Docker container on demand if a user asks for it, maybe through some web interface, because it's so fast, right? Suppose that you say, I want to edit a GitHub project or a Git project, check it out into a container, instantiate it, allow the user to, to edit it and uh, push data back out, uh, do commits, and then shut down the container again if you no longer need it. I think that working with a lot of uh, data orchestration developers on the same server, is not always gonna be ideal, not because of hop web issues, but because of performance. And yeah, this, is, this remains to be seen. 
but I think we've we've uh, we've did a great job in in creating that parity between the full client and the browser client. So most of uh, of the known issues are gone. We've uh, increased performance. We've yeah, this is uh, this is uh, going in the right direction. Hence our upcoming 1.0. Right. <laughs> All right. So. This is what I've had timed, two hours of talking. Is there anything else anybody wants me to cover? Now is the uh, extended time period of this game. Nope. Let's take a look at the chat, the Q&A. Uh, so yeah, so the, the user access, like I said, the, the, we, we uh, uh, I haven't done it myself, but I just heard that somebody did it. It's just uh, and it's documented how to, how to uh, put user access on top of it. Uh, it's the same like uh, WebSpoon in the past. So the idea is that you map users uh, to a particular home folder. Uh, so the the thing that we need to do is, is figure out how to map that to projects and stuff like that. But that's ongoing work. But technically, you know, technically, uh, a lot of that is already uh, possible. Um, so yes, like stopping the, the remote job, uh, I think um, not for Spark, but yes, for Dataflow. Uh, for the local runners, it stops as well. Um, but at some point, uh, that distinction, I think, uh, yeah, personally, I think it's it's badly managed in Beam in general. <laughs> um, um, but I think Hop can play a role there in uh, in providing maybe interfaces to existing web services uh, for Spark, Flink, and Dataflow so that we can tie into those, right? Um, I think that would be a better way of moving forward. Like I said in the past, in our community, I've been a big fan of, of revamping the way that we look at uh, long running pipelines and workflows, uh, have better transparency. Other things that I've been thinking of is uh, creating logging and um, uh, previewing uh, servers. So suppose that you run a hop server somewhere uh, next to your Spark cluster and all the snippets of because we 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 know we can we, we run code on the on the nodes right on in the transform so we can say like maybe every uh, maybe data flow is very good at, at at giving feedback how many records are running and the others are doing are not doing that asynchronously only at the end so maybe we can say okay so well that's not really a problem let's generate our own logging server, right? So let's generate a little bit of sample data, a couple of sample rows, metrics to, to a, a hop server, which gets collected and then the, the hop GUI can query that data or indeed create a more uh, dedicated server or service for that uh, so that we can uh, ourselves keep more track of these long running things. I think it would help transparency tremendously um, because yeah, it's, you can, you can run these spark jobs or, or these huge jobs and say, well, it's going to take like a few hours to run. But my impression is in a lot of cases, it's like, uh, let's wait and hope for the best. That's not good enough. I think we need to do better. Um, there are interfaces for Flink data flow to see um, but still, you know, it would be great to see actual data running through, through the pipeline. <laughs> and I think we can do that, you know, with a little bit of plumbing. I've done similar things in the past. Uh, you know, we can do that. 
So there's a lot to to put on the roadmap, uh, but I think we're already packing a lot of value for for uh, for users. Uh, the logging point in the meta is that for redirecting all logging that would normally go to the logging panel uh, to a stream for handling. So yeah, so all the logging, um, yes. So let's uh, let's jump back a little. Uh, so Hop has a really fine-grained way of capturing logging information. So if you have this logger for pipelines and uh, hang on. Uh, so if you enable the transform details, so this logging text here for the transform only contains the logging text for this particular transform. Um, and uh, this pipeline logging string contains the whole text of the whole pipeline. So there's the distinction. In fact, since uh, we're on the subject and it, it, you know it is an awesome company, there is a, the ability through the Neo4j plugins to log everything that you're doing through a graph by simply setting the Neo4j logging connection to a Neo4j database. You can simply start, start a Docker container. And in that case, what we will do is store the complete execution lineage graph of complex workflows. And if there are any errors, we can find the shortest path in this graph, right? So, um, so you see all the logging texts. Um, if you don't need that, that's fine. But it's my my realization is that a lot of the ways that we look at logging now, including Stack Driver and a lot of the technology out there, is simply not suited for complex hierarchies where a lot of dependencies and, and conditional paths are being taken. If the file is there, then uh, process it. If not, or look at the type of file and then do this. Those complex scenarios, um, if you look at those after the facts, simply with the logging text, it's very hard to figure out what, what, what went on. And with a graph, you can basically see the, the exact path that was taken at runtime. And if an error occurs, you can do a shortest path between the top level workflow and the, the transform or the action where the error occurred. And it finds the shortest path and say, this is the execution lineage. And it does this in milliseconds. So give this a chance. The documentation is out there for Neo4j. It takes all of five minutes to try it out. Um, so, but yeah, you can do it yourself. You can, you can, uh, uh, you can store the hierarchies in a relational database as well. It's just that querying the hierarchies of the execution lineage. It's just such, such a pain if you don't have a graph database. All right. Uh, is there another Q and A? Yeah, Bart is uh, busy answering. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bart. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, yeah, so uh, Bart and the team did a, did a really great job in uh, in all these guides, right? This is not something that was written uh, yesterday evening. <laughs> uh, the, the user manual, the getting started guide, uh, the documentation has been uh, revamped a couple of times. If you do find any missing links or whatever, please let us know. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll slowly end. Uh, first of all, thank you. Join the Hop community. Uh, file a bug report, right, in JIRA. Like I showed you, 317 cases fixed since uh, the previous release. That's a lot. You can always join our chat server. We'll help you out uh, with your complex scenarios. Follow us on Twitter for releases, tips, links. Um, YouTube is also cool. Uh, uh, so Ricardo has been uh, posting uh, uh, training material in uh, Portuguese uh, from Brazil. Uh, but we do regular hop hangouts, which are recorded. 
similar to this, but maybe less in depth, uh, usually about 45 minutes an hour. And then we dive into either business topics or um, uh, more technical sessions, right? So starting September, we'll, we'll probably pick those up again. And uh, yeah, end-to-end -end workflows, uh, Apache hopping, Docker pipelines, testing, and so on. So yeah, we already did like a, a session on Spark Link and, and, uh, and Dataflow. All right.